I really feel like it's weird to ask a gym bro about medical, scientific, related information that people spend their whole life studying and these people spend their whole time hating on. But trauma, to a certain degree, is a thing. Is it? Because, well, if you look at, you know, all available data and people that go through certain things. I don't know what that means. But like, if you look at all available data, but if you're saying like, do people have emotional disturbances? I would agree with you. I think if you tell people that they have trauma, they will absolutely be affected by whatever the thing is. I agree. I'm saying that things happen. So I gave the extreme example last time, but it's probably worth repeating. So you're a 14 year old girl and you all of a sudden have this man you don't know. And he has sex with you. He's 35 years old. Traumatic. I think most people would be like, okay, that's a traumatic experience. It was also just the middle ages and you might actually be a wonderful daughter doing her duty because that's when they got married and they would be married to men who are significantly older for alliances for their family. Were they traumatized or was that just like actually the, they were actually being a good daughter doing their duty as a, as a daughter of their family. We seem to be more free than ever before. We can order whatever food we'd like. We can travel almost anywhere and pursue any career that our heart desires. True. And yet depression and burnout are also everywhere. The mental health crisis has only increased. Ooh, you mean the meaning crisis? Just kidding. Why is this? When was the last time you felt like you were enough? We are always striving to do more and to be more. Ooh, when do you feel like you are enough is a very interesting question, actually. Why is this? When was the last time you felt like you were enough? Ooh, that is a question you asked a depressed person. That's a depressed person question. Like, unless you're depressed... You basically should always feel like you're enough to some extent. I Maybe I'm wrong on that. But the idea of not being depressed and feeling, hmm, not feeling like enough feels weird for me not to imagine that's associated with mental health, obviously, or depression of some kind or existential dread, I suppose. Yeah, you never feel like you're good enough, ready enough, mom enough. I mean, I do have intrusive thoughts of not being good enough, but they don't, they're very like within reason of self-doubt, but they're not very important versus before when I was in the height of my depression and borderline and all that stuff, my thoughts of not being enough were like all encompassing. I think there's like a difference there between am I having all encompassing mental health issues that are even without like so outside reasonable, like I'm just being unreasonable with not feeling like enough or am I um, like suffering from perfectionism, which is mental health. Am I suffering from a lack of feeling validated enough, which is I would argue mental health. Like I mean, I would argue a lot of it is also a mixture of philosophy, right? A lack of meaning. We are always striving to do more and to be more, to always be improving ourselves. I would argue that it is this cultural emphasis on self-improvement that leaves us so fundamentally burnt out and depressed. In such a culture, we embrace hyperactivity, finding ourselves in a state of compulsive striving. We have little time to connect with both ourselves and others. We are steeped in the normalized myth that we are each of us mere individuals striving to attain private goals. Ah, Gabor Mate. I want to read his, but everyone's always recommending me this book, The Myth of Normal. The more we define ourselves that way, the more estranged we become from vital aspects of who we are and what we need to be healthy. Our culture is not good for mental health, and this shouldn't be shocking news. Researchers like Tim Kasser have found the four principles of American corporate capitalism, self-interest. Guys, is his volume really low? My OBS says it's pretty high, but again, my OBS might be reading things incorrectly. How's it now? And also earphones will change how you hear things and speaker will change how you hear things. Just FYI. Desire for financial success, consumerism and competition consistently lead to poor mental health outcomes. So when he says like our world or our societies and built for mental health, he's obviously talking about America, I assume, because like, you know, or the world maybe, but like, I don't know if that's universally true. Why then do we continue to endorse and embrace such a culture? This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Oh. The research lab I worked in actually tested a lot of Tim Kasser's theories, specifically examined. Ooh, I'm going to mute that, but that's awesome. I'm going to keep it going. Honestly, I don't know most people if I have, oh my God, Fishy says, I, don't, I honestly don't know if most people are actually trying to improve. They're just trying to meet standards outside of themselves. Mm, I think that's a little bit of the issue 
is it feels a little bit like people are always trying to appeal to the bubble rather than like understand themselves, like really know themselves, which takes a lot of energy though. It might be better just to think about society for some people, you know? Okay, Liz says it's like shame versus guilt. Shame is associated with feeling you are inherently bad and worthless. Stuff like guilt and perfectionism can cause you to feel bad though. They do for me. Interesting. Yeah, I feel like for me, shame definitely has to do with disappointing the expectation of the bubble and guilt, my own expectations. So I rarely feel guilt or shame because I'm meeting my standards, right? The bubble I created, I almost never feel shame because I, I'm i pretty basic and I act within the means of that expectation. And then when it comes to... By step solutions and fun... Oh my gosh, this is still going. And then when it comes to guilt, like I rarely betray my values. And if I do, then I just make amends for it. But I feel like when people are suffering from what they call guilt or shame, it's because they're still inherently operating their consciousness within the bubble. Discord says with chronic health problems, I struggle not feeling enough at times. I will I will say I have those thoughts of not feeling like I'm doing good enough based off my own standard. But then I also know that that's a part of feeling sick. So then I don't pay too much attention to it because obviously that's just me getting used to the new normal. And I obviously don't give a fuck what other people think I'm going through because they don't fucking know, obviously. Like just thinking about it with the fibro or the expectation of having a baby, the strain on my body would be outrageous. Like I don't need other people's input about how my body feels in relation to having babies. So I don't give a fuck what they expect of me in terms of being a mother. But that's because like I've also disassociated, like I've moved myself away from their expectations because it's not my values, right? I'm obviously still working on, you know, not allowing my thoughts to be like, you're the same, you're the, you can get back to original Britney. Like I'm never going to be original Britney again. I have to tell myself you're still getting used to things, obviously, because I keep forgetting I'm chronically ill and then it flares up and I'm like, you can't do shit you used to do, girl. So yeah, obviously I agree with Discord. Like those thoughts do come into my mind where I'm like, oh my God, like why aren't we the same as we used to be, meaning why aren't we good enough? But we are good enough because this is the new normal, you know, something like that. And then shame, yeah, is about the core in relation to the bubble. Okay, so I could see that, absolutely. I feel like that's what philosophy and meditation is for, is to recontextualize your own understanding of your consciousness in relation to these things, like their constructs created and related to genetics and learned behavior and trauma. And so obviously they're they're something that you can decide to engage with or to move away from. This form of social organization tells people what they should do through surveillance and monitoring. Interestingly, in his later years, Foucault wrote about a more specific form of discipline that he called the technologies of the self. Mm. Intentional and voluntary actions by which men not only set themselves rules of conduct, but also seek to transform themselves, to change themselves in their singular being, and to make their life into an oeuvre nice. that carries certain aesthetic values and meets certain stylistic criteria. Such individuals might abide by a strict morning routine, practice cold showers, and subscribe to a set Ew. of self-improvement and self-help podcasts. And they will likely feel a sense of freedom and pride in doing so. Mm -hmm. Such an individual appears to stand in contrast to the fearful subject of the disciplinary society, as they aren't being compelled to follow such a strict routine by some authoritarian observer. They are free to become who they've always wanted to be. Interestingly, as Byung-Chul Han argues, a society that normalizes this technology of the self is actually more effective in extracting resources from its members than the surveillance methods of disciplinary societies. Instead of a society that runs on telling people what they should do, this new form of control tells people what they can do. Ooh, Maiden says, sometimes I wonder if this propensity for self-help is a trauma response. Let me tell you, all these self-help people never fucking go to therapy. And again, I'm saying therapy like a doctor, not like go to a therapist who's a doctor, but if you have a broken leg, don't watch a self-help podcast. You can watch the self-help podcast about what to do after you've gone to the doctor for your broken leg. I think that's really helpful or maybe before so you know, oh, I should go to the doctor. But I feel like a lot of these people ask Reddit or listen to podcasts or ask their friends before they ever go to people who have actually spent their life studying things. The reason you want to go for a therapist who's obsessed with their work. Look, you don't want to go to a therapist that's in it for the money. And you don't want to go to a therapist that's like uh, got a really strong ideology. You want to go to a therapist who's an interested, 
curious, scientific person who's very interested in solving problems for their clients and for medicine in general, right? Like mental health. So you want to go to somebody who's actually interested and thoughtful, right? About solving problems. You don't want to go to somebody again who's pushing an ideology because they're just going to fucking make you one of them. You don't want to go to somebody who just wants money because like they're not going to fucking help you. You want to go to somebody who's actually very curious and loves their work. Like that's the kind of therapist I recommend. Somebody who really loves problem solving so they can help you problem solve, right? Somebody who really likes it. Same with doctors. Like I don't, I can always tell bad vibes, good vibes from doctors. Not all doctors are good people, right? So again, you don't want a doctor who's just like, just there to get a paycheck. You want a doctor who's actually invested and thoughtful about their clients, So I feel like these self-help podcasts, I think that they're there to make money. I think they're there to do that. I was watching Graham Stephan talk about how, you know, he was a realtor and that validated him in terms of talking about being a realtor and selling houses and making money. Then he made his money and because he became a millionaire, he could then talk about being a millionaire. And on YouTube, he eventually realized that a lot of the guys who have podcasts now aren't even in the businesses that gave them the qualifications to have a podcast that made people listen to them. Now they run podcasts telling people how to be like they were 20 years ago. And there's something about that that I think is like really important to remember. A lot of the self-help podcasts literally were in their industries just long enough to use it as a qualifier to have the podcast, which was always the goal, or to have a means of doing something else, or to like, you know what I mean, not actually work the job that they are best known for. So I think that that's really important. And I think that's why I'm a little hesitant. to. And I consume them all, by the way. Look, I'm a heavy consumer of the self-help podcasts, but a lot of them are not very deep. A lot of them are not as helpful as they appear, but they do have tools to give you. You know what I mean? I do think they have tools to give you. It's just probably not everything. So going back to what Maiden said, um, the propensity for self-help is a trauma response. I do think people who consume self-help, who read all the books, who do all that stuff constantly, 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 I do think they're probably still looking for answers that these bubbles aren't going to give them because they're not in the business of solving your problems. And to be fair, a lot of the ways they want you to solve their problems or your problems is specific to how they solve theirs, which to be fair, you know, which is why I don't really say like I do self-help because I feel like it's dishonest. I feel like I'm just a person sharing my story and calling it self-help feels like I'm being dishonest because I don't think I'm doing that. I think I'm heavily recommending you go to professionals. And I feel like self-help is this idea that you can get it from me and not the professionals. You can't get it from me. I'm just like one of the puzzle pieces. You have to go to professionals for professional needs. And often your mental health is a professional need. And then your existential dread, that's a philosophy need. You know? This is smart power, a power that compels people to subject themselves to power relations completely on their own accord. Rather than inhibiting or repressing, smart power motivates us to self-optimize. Rather than a disciplinary society, we now live in an achievement society. Instead of the tireless surveillance of disciplinary societies that measure and observe their subjects in order to optimize productivity, we have now taken surveillance into our own hands. Motivated by the need to improve ourselves, we use apps, ranking systems, and health data to determine if we are self-optimizing enough. The auto-exploiting subject carries around its own labor camp. As a self-illuminating, self-surveilling subject, it bears its own, internal panopticon within. The digitalized, networked subject is a panopticon of itself. This ensures that each and every person has now taken on the task of conducting perpetual auto-surveillance. This is far more efficient than the techniques used in a disciplinary society. If we see ourselves as a project that can always be worked on, there is always more for us to do. Not only do we take on the task of monitoring and measuring ourselves, we also feel compelled to constantly improve ourselves under the idea that this is fundamentally good for us. As an entrepreneur of himself, the neoliberal... I I think what's important is to be introspective. You know, I was watching Alex Hermosa, very popular, made $100 million opening gyms across America, which then brought him into the podcast world. And he was being asked on the Ice Coffee Hour by Graham Stephan. And 
his co-host, he was being asked about depression or anxiety or something in that regard. And he said, you know, I just don't think these things are really that real. And I think that the way you have a relationship with them changes and da da da. But these aren't mental health professionals. Like once again, stop asking gym bros about their mental health. I really feel like it's weird to ask a gym bro about medical, scientific, related information that people spend their whole life studying and these people spend their whole time hating on. I want to know, yeah. because we talked, I think it was the first or second time you came yeah. on the podcast about trauma. Sure. Because you have very interesting takes on trauma. <laughs> it really has to do with the way that other people respond to your trauma yeah. and then your perception of how you should be feeling yeah. after a specified event occurs. I agree. Which is crazy. I'll, t I'll add one piece to what you said. Yes. Which is that you said um, people experience trauma. I would just erase that. Things happen. Things happen. No right. need to label good or bad. Right. Things happen to people. It's meaning that's is a, really that's, just that's what a you very hard switch, to it, though. though. Totally. That's like that's a whole yeah. different level to this. Sure. Like, was I traumatized by the the fifteen million dollar loss? No. Was it unfortunate? Yes. Did I deal with it? Yes. Okay. I'm not traumatized. I'm not like I can never make it bad again. But trauma, to a certain degree, is a thing. Is right? it? Because well, if you look at you know all available data and people that go through certain things. I don't know what then, that means, but like, do you, if you look at all available data, but if you're saying like, do people have emotional disturbances? I would agree with you. I think if you tell people that they have trauma, they will absolutely be affected by whatever the thing is. I agree. I'm saying that things it. happen. So I gave the extreme example last time, but it's probably worth repeating. So you're a 14 year old girl and you all of a sudden have this man you don't know. And he has sex with you. He's 35 years old. Traumatic. I think most people would be like, okay, oh, that's a traumatic experience. It was also just the middle ages and you might actually be a wonderful daughter doing her duty because that's when they got married and they would be married to men who are significantly older for alliances for their family. Were they traumatized or was that just like actually the, they were actually being a good daughter doing their duty as a, as a daughter of their family. So there's literally things that we can state with facts. This happened. A 35 year old man had sex with someone that he had never seen before and that she had never seen him and she was 14 years old. That happened. Everything else we do is the narrative we create around it. And I use that extreme example, which everyone like, you know, pulls away when I say that, but it's like, you have to use the extremes to make the point. And so like, if that can be both duty in one setting and horribly traumatic in another, that it means that the narrative is the thing that gives all the power. I just feel like it's such a weird question to ask them. To be fair to Graham Stephan and stuff, he just push back, him and Jack, do push back on things and say like, I think people are really having these experiences. But you know what? <laughs> there could be instances that happen that definitely change your entire mindset. Like let's say you, you are driving fast on the freeway all the time and then you get in a horrible car accident. Yeah. You could be terrified of driving, especially yeah. at that speed for good reason. Maybe your your entire perception is 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 changed after that. Trauma is just accelerated learning. It's all it is. It's accelerated learning. And the question is just, is the behavior that I learned something that I want? Does it serve me? But it is one of those things where these gym bros, these self-help guys, they're just like feeding into the bubble of gym bros who like want to get better, but don't actually want to do the hard work. They just want to do work that feels hard. It's like the David Goggins obsession with suffering, but they don't suffer with wisdom in my opinion. So... David Goggins will say like, I could take a pill for my ADHD, but I might as well just like suffer every morning and run. And I'm like, or you could just take a fucking pill, bro. And like function 10, 20, 30% better and have to run a little bit less on your knees. It's like they're committed to suffering in the most unwise way. <clears throat> and they make a lot of money doing it because I think people think the solution to the world, the solution to life is hard. And it is hard, but it's usually emotionally, mentally hard. It's rarely physically hard. Like, I'm going to be real with you. It's rarely physically hard, you know, but they feel, I think, more fulfilled thinking like they're rough and they're tough and they like experience something. But then they want to give themselves credit for being great wisdom, like think are great, like wise people or they've been really well read. But like, you know, again, what's hard is facing yourself and you have to face yourself by recognizing like you might even be like cock blocking your success even now. You know, so again, peace and love to David Goggins. But don't you think it's a little unwise that he's destroying his body so he can keep up his discipline instead of taking a pill that medical science has like shown over time to help? Now, he doesn't have to. And maybe no pill will ever work for him. That's possible. It's not a guarantee medicine will work for you. It just feels really weird to reject it because it feels like a cop out. That sounds like mental health. 
Can you imagine not getting your like, not going to your doctor to get surgery? Because if like, I mean, you can do that, right? We just watched that guy who wouldn't go on dialysis because he either wanted to heal naturally or die naturally. Fine. Whatever, bro. You do you. Achievement subject engages in auto exploitation willingly and even passionately. The self as a work of art amounts to a beautiful but deceptive illusion that the neoliberal regime maintains in order to exhaust its resources entirely. We are then capable of unlimited self-production, making ourselves into better and better marketable commodities by making sure we are, for example, in shape, have an attractive partner, and are making enough money. And this involves more than mere career aspirations. Physical optimization means more than aesthetic practice alone. Sexiness and fitness represents new economic resources to be increased, marketed, and exploited. This compulsive drive to improve ourselves under this idea of ourself as a project can now take over our entire lives. Mm. This pressure to achieve, to be more, and do more leads to a sort of culturally induced narcissism. As Steven Reisner writes, hmm. narcissism and sociopathy describe corporate America, but it's flat out wrong to think in 21st century America that narcissism and sociopathy are illnesses. In today's America, narcissism and sociopathy are strategies, and they're successful strategies. In well, I mean, to be fair, like, they are strategies for sure. And I think a lot of content creators especially utilize them. They have to. You almost have to be more sociopathic. So like every hate comment doesn't make you want to unalive yourself. And you kind of got to be narcissistic enough to even start posting content in the first place because you, you're you convinced like people should listen to you. And I am. I think I have a lot to offer um, the right people who like need to hear it. But also, you know, I think I'm fun. I think I'm fun to hang out with. Like the stream, guys. Like the stream. But yeah, I do. I do think you need just like enough narcissism and sociopathy without them being the diagnoses, like antisocial personality disorder and NPD. But I do. Yeah, I do think that. In temporary society, it is effective for us to be constantly focused on ourselves and monitoring our performance and self-image. To be so fixated on promoting ourselves is to never let your guard down, to compulsively market and improve yourself in the hopes of one day perfecting your self-project. This constant self-reference develops into a rat race within oneself, and eventually it could lead to burnout, or what Byung Chul Han describes as eye tiredness. The mm. ego grows exhausted and wears itself down. Such tiredness stems from the redundancy and recurrence of the ego. We exhaust ourselves with ourselves. Evidently, burnout is more often than not treated as an annoyance or a failure in mastering oneself fully. It is seen as a weakness and should be treated immediately lest we run the risk of falling short of our journey towards self-optimization. But I think burnout and depression should be seen more as the very symptoms of this compulsion for achievement. In Wariness of the Self, Ehrenberg points to this achievement society as the root of this rise in depression. Depression began its ascent when the disciplinary model for behavior broke against norms that invited us to undertake personal initiative by enjoining us to be ourselves. The depressed individual is unable to measure up. He is tired of having to become himself. It is this voluntary self-exploitation that gives rise to a fractured soul. We experience severe dislocation, a loss of connection with ourselves and others, as we compulsively strive for self-perfection. Depression. That that's the problem. Is like I don't believe in perfection, and I do think perfection is the disease of a nation, as the great philosopher Beyonce once said. So I do think that's probably part of the problem. Is like I don't seek perfection, and I think people who do are neurotic in a way that is like just insanity. But it looks sane because it looks like productivity, and so people have convinced themselves that it's like reasonable. All the perfectionists I know in my life are successful in a lot of ways, but they're also very unhappy you know they're pretty unhappy and i think that is because they're seeking something that's so without reason like guys i mean this in the greatest way and maybe this is my biology so i'm very lucky but i refuse to be that inefficient and it's so inefficient to seek perfection it's just such a cock block it makes no sense i have a friend who's a perfectionist and they were like i can't believe you're willing to post youtube videos this was like when i was you know years ago and I was like, well, if I never posted and I waited until the perfect moment, I just wouldn't be a content creator. And now I'm doing it full time. I've got a great audience. Thank you guys for being here. I've got a great support system. I've got a great job. I'm really, really lucky. 
And to my perfectionist friends, like they would never, they would never have been able like to post the way that I posted, but I just posted anything and everything. Even now, you know, I'm always getting better, better every year as a content creator, but I just can't, I can't wait for things to be perfect. They never will be. And I just, I, I, I just know I'm going to die. So I can't do it, you know? So again, it is kind of interesting, this idea of perfectionism. I think that's why I don't like the self-help bubble very much. And I don't like the guru bubble. It's like everyone feels very much like they're seeking perfection. Even the audience wants it from you. Like the audience wants you to be perfect. And I just like, I don't like it. It feels exhausting. And burnout are simply the canaries in the coal mine in terms of demonstrating the destructiveness of such an achievement culture. This is not to suggest that self-improvement or the striving to be a better person is inherently maladaptive. Such a journey is healthy and often beneficial. However, we should pay close attention to when such a process collapses into a hellish cycle of excessive self-reference and exhaustion. It is more than likely that such an outcome is the result of- And it says, I don't think people see it as perfection though, just as better. Uh, I don't know. The people in my life do reference it as being perfect and they do use the word perfection and they are self-aware enough to know that they struggle from it. And even the men in these self-help things, they always say, like, I want to be the best. I want to be the most this. I mean, that's basically what the idea of perfection is around. So, yeah, some people definitely don't know it's perfection or they think about it as being perfect. The people in my life, though, do reference it as that. Like, they use those words. So Of self-exploitation rather than healthy, intrinsically motivated self-improvement. Alienation is inevitable when our inner sense of value becomes status-driven, hinging on externally imposed standards of competitive achievement and acquisition, and a highly conditional acceptance in others' eyes. We struggle to answer the question, who am I? And this is an important question to answer if we wish to ever truly improve ourselves. Eric Fromm's Escape from Freedom is a masterful exploration of how freedom alone can nonetheless leave us unhappy, alienated, and vulnerable to authoritarianism. Negative freedom, the absence of constraints, does not bring us closer to solving the question of who we are. We live under the illusion that we know what we want, but, as Fromm argues, the sad fact of the matter is that we want that which we are supposed to want. This, I would argue, is at the root of compulsive self-improvement. We have become automatons who live under the illusion of being self-willing individuals. He lives in a world to which he has lost genuine relatedness and in which everybody and everything has become instrumentalized, where he has become part of the machine that his hands have built. Fromm's hmm. Hmm. here is simple, spontaneity. Seen in both artists and children, spontaneous activity does not abide by rigid self-optimization and improvement. Instead, it is an embrace of activity for the sake of the activity itself. Our that is not how I think of spontaneity. I'm not a very spontaneous person. That is not how I think of spontaneity. Um, what? That is not what I think of spontaneity as. I think of spontaneity as like thoughtless action versus like just doing things because I want to do them. I do that all the time. But like spontaneity to me is like thoughtless action, like doing it without a plan, like just like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it right now. But like, you're not just doing it because you want to do it. You don't even know why you're doing it. Like you're so spontaneous that you just like, without warning, without thought, that's how I think of spontaneity. Oh, that's funny. Um, Brianna says, are you still better than self-help? Like me, per like my content? I mean, I think everything gives you a tool. So like self-help can be very helpful. I've watched, like I said, tons of it. I just think it has like a stagnation of its own. And so it's not like the greatest tool. And same with me, like, I'm not the MD you need to go to. I'm not the therapist you need to go to. I'm like, I'm not a lot of things you need to go to. So I'm still, it's not about being better than self-help. It's about self-help being only part of the like spice of the soup. I'm just another spice, you know? Um, Jeannie says, as a therapist, I want to add clients don't bring problems to therapy. They bring their solutions that aren't working. Therapy helps identify the true problem and the more functional solutions. I'm not sure if you mean that in a black and white sense. Because I'm not, that's not my lived experience, I think. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Clients don't bring problems to therapy. They bring their solutions that aren't working. I mean, that's, I yeah, my, I'm only picking at your, I assume you didn't mean it in the way that you wrote it. But obviously not, it would be weird that if every client was coming into therapy that way, right? Some people just don't know what's going on and they have no solutions. 
And so they have problems, right? Like, am I misunderstanding? It just sounds like your wording is a little too black and white for me, but I think I get what you mean. Um, Hamone says, imperfect people thrive in the world every day. So why can't I? Not only, girl, that is so fucking true. That is like what I try to tell my perfectionist friends. I'm like, girls, look at the world and look how it's built by imperfect people forever since day one. You don't got to be perfect. It really don't have to be. You know what I mean? Mm -mm. Yeah, absolutely not. Kay says, my understanding of spontane spontaneous aligns with his. It can show itself in that careless form you're referring to, but I don't think the word itself has a negative attachment and expression. Yeah, I don't think it has a negative attachment and expression. I used to think I was a really spontaneous person, but then I realized like I don't think that I am. I think I think things out way too often to be very spontaneous. I do think things through very quickly though. And I've noticed that because I think quickly, I think people think it's spontaneity, even myself, but I, I do think about things pretty, yeah, I keep, I keep thinking spontaneity has to do with like a lack of thoughtfulness, but I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, Fishy, I'll write down this message. Off topic, Brittany, but at some point, can you make a podcast episode or video about how you manage the detachment, manage detachment from the current version of yourself while also being with a life partner? Detachment from this current version of yourself while also being with a partner. You might want to expand on that for me, but I'll write it down. Art, play, time with friends, and a gradual slowing down flies in the very face of the sorts of self-improvement that lead to burnout. As Frum writes, spontaneous activity is the one way in which man can overcome the terror of aloneness without sacrificing the integrity of the self. For in the spontaneous realization of the self, man unites himself anew with the world. This partially relies on truly giving attention to the moment. Through <gasps> Deep Valley with the super chat. You're dope. Thank you. You're dope. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it so much. Guys, thank you so much. Like the stream. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Thank you. Happy Friday. Act of listening and observing. The gift of listening, as Byung Chul Han observes, is entirely inaccessible to the hyperactive ego, which must close itself off in order to constantly measure and optimize itself. Any disruption from the outer world is considered to be a threat to achieving our potential. To listen is to open oneself up to themselves and the world around them. Our world has made us increasingly focused on ourselves as a project. This Yo, that's Vosh though right there, bro. He just explained Vosh to the T. Vosh does not listen because then it would mean he would have to face himself in a way that he's not definitely not ready for. This has made us rigid and incapable of spontaneity. It is only in those moments of intrinsic focus where we are doing things for themselves in which we can escape the burnout society. Uh, funny case says, yeah, I think I'm spontaneous, but I think quickly as well. So my spontane spontaneous actions aren't reckless or uneducated. Discord says, I think spontaneity spontaneous implies a lack of a plan. Interesting. Because, yeah, I used to think I was spontaneous, but then I thought, like, I'm not what I see in other people when they exhibit spontaneity. Like he said, the artist or the child. Like, yeah, that's not me. It looks like me because people think that's what's happening but i'm i'm really thinking i think most things through yeah not that i've never been spontaneous but i'm not a spontaneous person meaning i'm not chronically spun it's not a part of my personality and i do think about things like when people ask me out for lunch or for a phone call i don't i can't just say yes i have to think it through and think about the consequences how i'm gonna feel tomorrow if i do it and all that stuff call it a flow state spontaneity or resonance we find ourselves alive only when we risk destabilizing our journey towards mm. self-perfection. Here, I think Bertrand Russell gives us the most succinct path forward in combating self-absorption. The secret of happiness is this. Let your interests be as wide as possible, and let your reactions to the things and persons that interest you be as far as possible friendly rather than hostile great video as per usual. Yeah, I think the myth of self-improvement and this whole like self-help bubble, I think it can be incredibly important and an offshoot of that like becoming a whole human being about, you know, looking inward and thinking about where you are and what you have to do next. I think self-help is such a two bubble and I think self-help in itself 
is limited and stagnant, but I do think philosophy and th- and medical intervention like kind of help in a more tangible way. There's that episode of Sex in the City I often talk about where I think it's Charlotte or maybe it's Miranda, but they keep going to the self-help aisle and they realize this woman who's been chronically crying at the bookstore in the self-help aisle, you know, she's sitting there crying over the self-help book. She's like, I've read that book 10 times and oh, this is my favorite one. And they realize like looking at this woman who's on her 10th or 8th self-help book is still, well, not helping herself. So there must be a larger and bigger answer. And I think that is kind of how I see self-help as a very limited, good option temporarily um, bubble of thought. You know what I mean? And philosophy can be the same way in a sense if you like you know, stop yourself from considering a different idea or or updating a philosophy. Again, stagnation is up to you. You can be stagnant. I'm not going to moralize it for you. But I do think that if you stay in a place and you don't move forward and you don't look for more ways to question the self, then you're probably not being as introspective as you think, right? And if you let your pride stop you from getting help, how introspective can you be? You know, like, I mean, obviously on a spectrum, we all have to deal with that. Even I have to fight my ego and remind myself, like, you can ask for help. But if you, you know, really self-sabotage the point of not asking for help because of your ego. Thank you.